Everyone, uh, welcome to Assessing Learner Accountability through the online rubrics, which is through the Office of Online Learning. Uh, just as a general notice, um, this webinar is being recorded. We will be sending you a link to this recording with some additional resources after the webinar is ended. Throughout the entirety of the webinar, you're not required to speak through the microphone or use your webcam during this webinar, so you can leave those turned off. We will also have time for questions at the end of the presentation, so please take that time to ask us any questions through the chat feature. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Evelyn Burries from the Division of Education, who will be delivering today's webinar. Okay, take it away, Kit. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk to you this afternoon a, a little bit about what I have done in the classroom and what I've discovered about using eClass and rubrics and helping my students to become more responsible and accountable learners. So really, it's about fostering autonomous and responsible learners in general, regardless of where, what grade they're in or where they are in the learning process. This is not a new concept. It's been around for a long time. But the technology is making a difference. So this presentation is an, a small examination of the holistic nature of individual student learning and the most effective practices for helping students develop into autonomous and responsible learners and it, as it's enhanced by the current technology. So individual learning can occur in a group or on a one-to-one. -one. At every level of education there are concerns about fostering responsibility in students through a set of skills that can be maintained into adulthood. And I'm thinking of teaching even young children to um, take their work seriously, to be accountable, and to give them the skills that help them be part of the learning process as um, collaborators rather than um, simply receivers <coughs> of information. And most recently, you know, I've been thinking about teachers using laptops, mobile devices, and other kinds of emerging technology uh, appropriate to students across age, the age span, and finding creative ways to stimulate learner-centered dialogue aimed at responsible and collaborative learners, um, even for very young children. Uh, they can use um, technology to communicate with us and also to look at their own accomplishments. Technology has a way of providing immediate feedback for students. So when the technology is used effectively by parents and teachers with even the youngest of school age children, they begin to understand technology as a tool for learning and not just an entertainment media. I think of this when um, I ask a child a question or uh, they don't know the answer to something and their first words are, I'll Google that. And I'll Google that often leads into Googling other um, related information. And parents are also learning uh, to use this with their children. Closing the gap. As a grandparent, I know that um, I am a digital immigrant versus my grandchildren who are digital natives. And if you think about the VTech toys that children are exposed to at a very young age, six months, um, they are very much accustomed to pushing, pushing buttons and getting immediate feedback. And that's kind of the basis um, for their approach to technology. In some cases, I have students in college who have, there's a gap. So they're right between that digital native and the digital immigrant. They have some experience, but often not quite enough to use the technology efficiently. So if we're going to connect the use of technology to enhancing learning, it can be easily paired with a number of initiatives um, 
that are promoted by educators as well as the communities that those education educators and education systems represent. So one of the first things that came to mind for me was universal design for learning. If we, this is just an example of how we can link the technology to what we're teaching people, whether it's in the classroom or um, learning skills online for licensure or um, taking tests so that they can participate in another kind of program. But universal design for learning um, is a way of is allowing as many people as possible to become involved and to learn information. So the first part, of course, is representation. How do we present material to students? Uh, an e-class certainly gives us a lot of room for creativity and flexibility, providing multiple means of action and expression, and allowing students to engage in the process and even how we assess those students in that engagement. Um, the CAST link is below, uh, which has a lot of information about um, universal design. But my concern right now today is universal design for um, learning as it relates to um, E-class. So for my students, this as te candidates, teacher candidates, universal design for learning guidelines are posted on eClass, so they're there for them all of the time. But they also, <clears throat> but I also know that to model universal design for learning, I must include these three areas: multiple means of representation, uh, multiple means of action and expression multiple means of engagement. So I model those as I'm teaching my students. They, uh, back. I find that the students who know something about technology, but not everything about technology or how to use it. So when I'm um, teaching them, I have to teach them how to use eClass. It's not just like I put it on eClass and you can go there and find it. I need to teach them how to access it, how to read it, and how to use it. It's, I can put the information, they can get the information anywhere, but then how do they use it? So I remind them of these three areas um, and talk to them. The, the use of eClass, I think, really requires direct instruction so that um, they know exactly what to do when they go into e-class. You're probably all familiar with what e-class looks like when you go into it, or perhaps not. But here's the sample of an assignment, and the student would um, read this with whatever other information is on stated for that day. And then they would be able to submit their assignment. But before submitting the assignment, they have the opportunity to check the rubric. Now, rubrics are part of learning and should be part of learning um, from the time children are young. And I know that they are being used in elementary, middle, and high schools, as well as college. So the student sees the rubric. And they have a chance, when they're doing their writing, they can write to the rubric or their presentation or their creation of any kind. The rubric is there. And they can see the various levels of the rubric and um, decide where they're going to be and what is the level that they need or want to achieve or that they're most comfortable with. So we can see that most students are going to want to go to that level, too. And here it says, general discussion of main idea and author's point of view. And that's clear. We also, um, and then if someone is a little more involved in the activity, they can go to clearly identified 
main idea and accurate discussion of the author's point of view. So it gives them some options, some choices. It gives them a chance to use their strengths to the best of their ability. And where they have difficulty, they can make some modifications. But they understand what is asked of them, what is expected. This doesn't mean that they don't have um, access to the instructor. Um, E-Class also includes an, e an email feature, so if they're stuck, they can also email. But again, these rubrics must be taught in the classroom or taught directly. And this is a feature that I particularly like. It's the feedback. So the students know by looking at the feedback which areas they have done well in and perhaps which areas they might like to improve and they might like to go back and redo. Personally, I allow redos on rubrics because it's a learning process. Not only are students learning the information, they're also learning how to use rubrics. And not since not all rubrics are created the same, uh, I usually allow um, some variations. So if you get less than a 2 on your rubric, then you're allowed to redo it once which means when I look at the student's paper that has been submitted, I have an opportunity to review it and add comments and corrections and things for them to check. Um, I can do that you know, through little boxes in print. And although I haven't tried it, I've been told that I can also leave recorded messages to the students as I'm grading their work. This is very helpful. It's very individualized. So it's my message to that particular student. Oh, I guess I went rather quickly. <laughs> so um, I wanted to share this experience because I am seeing students who are caught in that gap and I am seeing students who are um, up and coming and using these um, rubrics and these um, instruction, instruction systems or these learning management systems and they can be very helpful. I like the idea of accountability because it keeps the students accountable but it also makes the teachers accountable. It is also a self-evaluation uh, tool for instructors. So when you're looking at the outcomes on the student's work, you can also change some of the things that you're doing um, or adjust them to your group that you're working with. So at this time, uh, does anyone have any specific questions with regards to online rubrics uh, for Evelyn or for myself? You can type your questions into the chat box and we will address them as best we can. Well then, perhaps I can show everyone just quick, briefly how to create a rubric or to utilize yes. a rubric on eClass. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with everyone. So if you'll just give me a moment. Uh, share, I'm just going to quickly pull up my desktop. If it will, I just, Share. Okay. Share my screen. There we go. So now everyone should 
So be able to see what I'm saying. All right, so this is me with an E class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly add an activity or resource in my course site. And just for the sake of this brief demonstration, I'm going to create a sample assignment. So to do that, um, actually, I'll go back for those who are not as E class savvy as you know some. Uh, I clicked on Add Activity or Resource. You click on what activity you would like. I clicked on an assignment. And then you click on Add. And then eClass will bring you to the screen for adding your new assignment and establishing the settings that you want. So for this, I'm just going to create an assignment name. And just because it's a sample, I'm going to create, say it's a sample assignment. If this was a real assignment, I could add a description for the students as well, like uh, to give parameters for what kind of assignment they would be submitting. And I'll just keep scrolling down. If you also have, um, for the instructor that is moving from paper documents, that would give the description of the assignment. Um, you could also use this Dropbox right here to upload those Word documents, PDF files, whatsoever, so that they could have that as a resource when they're looking into what kind of assignment they are submitting. Um, I'll kind of rush right through these, but you can set your uh, submission settings. So when you can start submitting your assignments, when the due date of the assignment is, if you are the type of instructor that wants a cutoff date where students will no longer be able to submit assignments, you can also establish that. This is particularly helpful to the students. I give specific instruction on um, the drop boxes and the dates because I always open the drop box about a week or two before the assignment is due. I have a due date and then depending on the assignment I might have, um, you might be able to drop it in two days late which means that you have a 10% penalty per day but it's not significant enough for them not to turn it in. Um, one of the things that I find about this is that it's very helpful in, it, in teaching students to arrange their time inevitably they will hold off on the assignment even though they have two weeks to work on it to wait until the day before or the day that it's due. So there is also some instruction with them on time management and how they can work, um, use these dates to do a partial, do part of the assignment one day and do part another day and then turn it in. So there's a lot of management, time management involved here and um, the approach that they use not to just to my class but looking at all of their classes and their due dates and that's been uh, quite a learning experience for a lot of students. Right. Um, yes and I also find that the due dates being present on an assignment, well even from a student standpoint and having been there <laughs> at one point or another, um, just having the, the clear due date is very nice to have. Um, and also, as an, from an instructor's standpoint, it's also very nice because then you're being very transparent about your expectation with regards to timing. And if a student does send in an assignment late, then it's when the student does submit that assignment, it's like right there in red print. The student submitted it two days, yes. three hours. No attempt. <laughs> No attempt at tears. Um, I think it's also very helpful for me because I'm not collecting papers. Uh, I don't take assignments online and I don't take hard copies. So um, the only assignments that are turned in are the ones that are turned in on um, eClass in the Dropbox. And then there's no disputes between the students because they can't say Oh, uh, I might have put in a wrong character in your email address. Uh, so let me just go back into my sent out box and uh, send you and, it yes. again. Yeah. Or oh, I left it on your desk. Are you sure you didn't get it? Yeah. So those are the availability timing settings for the assignment Dropbox feature in eClass. Um, with submission types, you can choose whether you want a file mm -hmm. to be submitted or if you want them to submit through a um, online text editor 
text box and having them type directly with any class. For feedback types, you can say whether you want to provide a feedback comment or like maybe a file um, of some sort um, if you if that's what you want to provide in addition to the feedback on the rubric. Um, for submission settings, you can like set whether you want them to uh, include a submit button. Um, if there's a submission statement you want, it, it, I find these to be uh, rather negligible, but if you want them, feel free. Um, the big thing uh, is the grade settings. So this is where we get into like you know, establishing like, you know, that we want a rubric. So um, the big thing is the grading method, so that what the method that you are using when you're going to grade them online. So right now it's automatically simple direct grading, which would mean you just go in and you just type in a number into a text box. So I'm going to change that now to rubric. Uh, and if I was using the eClass gradebook, I would establish which grade category I was using. Like so, if I had a separate category within the gradebook for uh, assignments or papers or what have you, I would choose which category I was going to use. So now that rubric is set as the grading method. I'm just going to go ahead and save. And it's going to automatically, so if I wasn't using a rubric as a grading method, it would automatically just save as is and establish the assignment Dropbox in eClass. But because I chose rubric as the grading method, it brings me to this sub page. So there's two methods, as you can see. I can either create a completely new rubric form from scratch, which I will go through, or you can create a new grading form from a template. There are several templates already provided on eClass. Some instructors who <laughs> perhaps had a standard rubric that's being used school-wide or through a division, they submitted those, and those are available online, in which you can go through. But to define a new grading form from scratch, I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, so let's say I'm uh, doing a journal article analysis rubric. And I could uh, put a little description for the students so that they would see that when they are going in to view the rubric. Um, you give a brief description, or maybe say with a source, if it's from the Division of Education. But to go ahead and create the rubric, you'll, have, you'll start off with this one little box right here. Um, so you click to start adding your criterion. So Let's say, for example, I want proper APA citations. Um, and say, like, so if they want two points, uh, no errors in APA citation. Um, one or two errors could be for one point. And then for zero points, it could be three or more APA citation errors. And that there, I just established one criterion on the rubric. To add another one, I just click on the Add Criterion button, and then I can create a new one. So perhaps grammar and spelling. And again, I could put no errors, or what, whichever standard I wanted to hold the students to. Our two errors three or more errors, and so on. So, and you can even add levels to each criterion. So if like uh, I wanted to add more levels, I could certainly do that. And I can manipulate the points for each level. So if I wanted it to be uh, multiples of two, so four points, two points, zero points, or so on, I could certainly manipulate those too. And then once I was done establishing the multiple criterions, I could just save the rubric, make it ready, or save as a draft and continue on later. Um, but once I save it, there it is. So if a student goes in to attempt this assignment, they would see this rubric front and center. And then they could scroll down and add submission. And so actually, let me go back and 
show everyone how to access a template rubric. Um, so I'm going to create another sample assignment quickly, and I'll just buzz right through this because we already saw all the setting options. So actually, uh, I'll give it the same name, sample assignment two. I'll just quickly buzz right down and, again, rubric as the grading method and save. So now I'm going to go to create new grading form from a template because there are a few available. And there is a option when you are creating a template that you can publish it publicly on our eClass system. So it wouldn't be available to other instructors from other institutions, but instructors that are using eClass within our institution, they will be able to see those. And if you think it's something that would be of value to them, then it would be published for them to use. Um, so for example, there's this business writing assignment rubric. I'll scroll, scroll down. Clearly, it's being used by the business division. Um, a shared template for response to intervention, which is of use to the Division of Education. Uh, a diagnostic report shared template. Um, also for the Division of Education, um, and so on and so forth. So if I found a rubric that I think could be useful to me, and I'll use, I believe, Evelyn, this is one of yours, FBA, BIP, yes, maybe? Yes. <laughs> You've yes. recently changed them, but yes, that's the one that it is. Mm -hmm. So I could go ahead and use this template. And it'll ask you, do you want to use the grading item form as a template? Continue. And then it automatically puts that template into the rubric. And if I wanted to, I could go in and edit it. If, like, for example, maybe like um, me and Evelyn had uh, uh, artistic differences about a one criterion, I could go in and edit the form to my liking, and then publish that version to the to the assignment module. And that is pretty much. It. So if you are an instructor that is interested in using rubrics on eClass, that is how to do it. And of course, if you are an instructor and you are interested, the Office of Online Learning is certainly available to you. You can come in for a one-on-one -on -one consultation and we can help build, among other, among things. other things, we could also help you um, build rubrics into your course, use rubrics or your assignment modules. Um, or if you just want to build an e-class site from the ground up, we can certainly help you with that as well. So right now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I just want to say that I find it very helpful when the key assessment for um, task stream um, goes, I try to create a rubric for a key assessment that's going to go into task stream. So then this is on um, site. I follow these directions. When I go into eClass, all I have to do is take the information from eClass. The students are supposed to submit it, and um, and they do. Uh, sometimes they get stuck, and I help them. But it's very easy to take the information from eClass and put it into task stream. And I imagine as we do more with um, some of the EDTPA information. Uh, we might be able to develop a flow where information can go from one source to another. But particularly for key assessments that go into task stream, I find this very helpful. OK, and Jen, I can see that you're typing. Oh yes, that is a project that we have been working on. Uh, Jen said uh, we will be integrating Task Stream and eClass soon. Nick has been working on me with us. Yes, and we are working with Task Stream so that essentially everyone would just have to go to one place on eClass in order to upload things to Task Stream. So basically, uh, you would have to go less places to accomplish the same tasks. Right. But it's certainly um, a convenient way of keeping track of things during the semester and then you know, getting them submitted. Yeah, 
uh, and Nick will be coming to the division meeting on April 25th for a demo. Perfect, that's awesome. It's coming up soon. Uh, great information and presentation. Thank you, of course, uh, IT. Um, so um, at this time, are there any other lingering questions? Any stray thoughts that everyone wa anyone wants to give a voice to? No, thank you for showing. Uh, so, um, and Carol's typing, so I'll wait a moment. Thank you. So thank at you. this time, um, we are going to be sending up, out a follow-up email to everyone who was present today uh, with a recording of this webinar and any other supplemental information that we can provide. Um, so if you would like uh, the recording of the webinar, could you please put your email address, your preferred email address, into the chat box? <laughs> John, I didn't realize it was you. <laughs> well, John, officially, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, so yeah, so I'll be sure to follow up with the three of you um, with our uh, webinar recording, which is something we will also be publishing on YouTube for other instructors to utilize. So um, if anyone has any questions after today, um, the Online Learning Office is certainly accessible via email at onlinelearning at msmc.edu, which will also create a support ticket on your behalf on the ticket system. We are also available by phone. With our main support line is 845-569-3457. And our general office hours are Monday through Friday, 8 AM to 5 PM during the uh, traditional academic term. Uh, we do have addressed hours during the breaks, but uh, we are here for any support you may need. So, well, thank you. Yes, thank you all for coming, and I hope you all have a very pleasant day.